Welcome to PartialArc.com. <laughs> Don't do that. I'm here to save the day. I'm here, here, here to save the day. Soon I will be invincible. <laughs> Because Because Comics. Welcome to Because Comics. This is episode 23. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co-host, the prehistoric Mike Christensen. <laughs> Clever girl. I'm actually, it's true, I'm, I'm back. I'm, yeah. I'm back, just like in the movie We're Back, mm-hmm. uh, starring John Goodman as a T-Rex. We know we don't talk about that movie. We don't talk about it enough, really. <laughs> I mean, people wake up in the morning, they go to work, they make coffee, they eat lunch, they come home, they kiss their wife and kids, and they just don't talk about that movie anymore. They don't think about it. It doesn't yeah. enter into their minds that there's a movie out there. I believe at the end, doesn't a man get eaten by crows? And, like, we just completely forget that that happens. Man, it's, it was a weird... That era of animation is really strange. It is. Because there's... There's Disney, and then there's everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone else just kind of got shuffled into the land of Swan Princess and Page Master. Yep. Where it's like, oh yeah, I loved that movie for a year. Have I ever seen it? I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> there, were, there were books, I swear. There were animated books. He had a sword, or was that sword in the stone? Damn it. What were we here to do? <laughs> All right. So, guys, as we do every week, we kick things off with our polls from our poll list. So I will kick things off today talking about a unknown character to most. Um, He wears a big black helmet, has a really nice big black cape, and has a big old red laser sword. His name is Darth Vader. Oh, I was totally going to guess... Uh, Gem in the Holograms. Really? No. (laughs) (laughs) So Darth Vader, guys, he is a comic. Um, As we've been seeing lately, there's been this huge push by Marvel because they own Star Wars now, or Disney owns them. Whoever owns who owns whoever. Yeah, Disney Disney owns everything. I'll just cut to the chase. They own everything, and we couldn't be happier. At least I couldn't be. But they're pushing out these new Star Wars comics. They've got Star Wars. They've got Princess Leia, which is coming out. Mm -hmm. And one of them is Darth Vader. Now, Darth Vader is written by Kieran Gillen, who I love. Because Young Young Avengers, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. And I think he, he just does a lot of stuff that I like. End up being like, line, I love yeah. this comic. Oh, it's written by Karen Gillan, of course. Yeah. And then Salvador La Roca does the art. Mm-hmm. And the art's pretty awesome. It looks like it's lifted straight from the movies. Yeah, like It looks like these are scenes that we missed. We're like, oh, yeah, that was in there for he's sure. He's great at that. That is so up his alley. And it's awesome because the comic is basically about... Darth Vader, because that is the title of the comic. Sure. But basically, you're wondering, you know, how are you going to make a comic about Darth Vader? Because the fun of Darth Vader is, you know, you don't know that much about him. You know, if you get, you spend too many scenes of him being really sad and yelling, no, like it starts to lose a little bit of that fun. But the comic does well enough with putting Darth Vader in all these scenarios, letting him be Darth Vader-y, mm-hmm. choking, threatening people, being super smart and crafty, but without, like, having to be, like, digging into, like, this is where I was, uh, you know, as a kid and where I get flowers and, right. like, I mean, giving like, him a love interest not, or something not weird. Not to get too deep into the prequels, they are much maligned, and we can certainly discuss them at some point. Right. But the, the problem is that you don't really get to see Darth Vader be Darth Vader. Which is those, what you in want. In those movies, which is why we kind of want to buy the ticket. And, like, you get flashes and glimpses but it's just not it's not like damien omen exactly. like you know it's just like oh man he's just super evil man, all the time forever. Evil. Yeah. and it's like because that's the story they're telling you don't get to see right which Darth is Vader. fine i get that too i mean yeah, like you want to have that fall right? it is what it is and just because of that we haven't gotten a lot of awesome darth vader like sideline stuff <laughs> and for me myself i was also worrying like do if i get too much darth vader is it like does he work better in small doses right. but man is he super fun to just be darth vader in all the time so so far as of this recording there's only been two issues out mm-hmm. and they're really great without going into any plot details you really just get to see darth vader navigating the political environment of the empire after the first death star explodes so that's where this comic kicks off right first death star has exploded palpatine is super pissed about it and you know <laughs> And it's all about how does Darth Vader, who's kind of fallen from grace in the eyes of the Emperor and really in the eyes of some of these other, you know, jerky senator guys among the Empire, how does he still do his Darth Vadering and kind of regain his power and still be uh, that uh, that badass that we all love? And he kind of retraces some really fun scenes that we've seen other characters do. But guys, Darth Vader is super fun, (laughs) the character and also the comic, and uh, I highly recommend it. It's sort of like the... 
the struggle of having a Magneto comic is like, mm-hmm. you know, yes, he has to be main character, and yes, he has to have his foibles, and yes, he has to you have to root for him to some degree. There's also a reason you bought the comic. It's because Magneto is on the cover. <laughs> yeah, and you like Magneto. And this, I mean, Darth Vader. People love Darth Vader, and that's when he was in scenes with the heroes. Like, what's great about this is you're putting him in scenes with other terrible characters. Mm-hmm. So it's totally fine to be rooting for Darth Vader because he's like. I mean, he's not the lesser evil, but he's, like, the more fun evil out of all these other ones. He's surrounded by space Nazis. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, ah, he's not really a space Nazi. He's just kind of, you know, well, I don't know. (laughs) I don't really know what Darth Vader you categorize him. Anyways, Mike, (laughs) what is your pull from your pull list? My pull is an Image Comics comic called Copperhead. It's uh, written by Jay Farber and drawn by Scott Godlowski, and it is... Now, it's not about the Batman villain Copperhead, is it? It's not. It's a a western in space. Whoa, I now, love those. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny because you say, like, oh, I love those. Like, those are a thing we've seen. Yeah. Because we have things like Firefly and, to a degree, Cowboy Bebop and... East of West, which is a comic we haven't talked about, but we will. Yeah, <laughs> or Sparks Nevada, Marshall on Mars. Like, exactly. There's, there's a lot out there that satisfies the need for space westerns. This one's like Deadwood. Hmm. This is like Deadwood in space, because it's all around one location, and everyone's terrible. <laughs> it just happens to be on, like, Saturn or something like it's, that? It's set in this post-war environment, much like all those westerns are post-Civil War. There was this war between these aliens and the humans, and the humans won, and the aliens are kind of stuck being kind of the second-class citizens ah, now. sad. And so, like, there's this one guy, this deputy to the new sheriff, who is an alien, and he's great, and he's a great character, and he hates his, like the nickname that the human sheriff gives him because it's like a bastardization of his name and he's just sort of grumbly and obviously very angry he is not the sheriff. Right. He understands why he's not the sheriff and he's not happy about it. Uh, But the... Did he used to be the sheriff? Like No, he was basically... He would have been next in line and Uh. they passed him over. So he's going to do his job because he's a professional but he's not going to be happy about it and he's not going to be a nice guy. Uh, But the lead is also not super nice. Uh, Her name's Clara and she's the new sheriff coming in with her son to basically moving to this small little town to be their sheriff. And you've got some great scenes that you see straight out of Westerns where like the upstart like official like chubby fat guy who's like yes we have the town in our pocket if you know what i mean and, like, yeah there's always that one dude who's just the slimy guy who in every town never check his privilege in the nope. world and and it basically wants to kind of like well i hope we're on the same side here take and some of these coins and we won't have any problems it's miss. that it's that kind of scene and we've seen it before but clara is just so like no we're not doing this like i will have awesome. none of this and she's very she's a hard ass and she is like as as hard as nails as you need to be to be a western character to be a western character in space too <laughs> especially and we've talked about um pretty deadly which is another western right. style and where you have just these hard it has an heroes. undead rabbit talking to something <laughs> it does but that's like another comic where you have these really hard-edged heroes and this one i'd say even more so because it's it's more sort of the standard procedural format you know they're not dealing with like whether the de- death had a daughter or whatever like in pretty deadly right this is just like oh there's a murder oh this is going on and we're investigating this and what about the natives and that kind of thing okay but it's also really interesting and there's really great scenes with her and her son and her son kind of meets one of these oh aliens. so that's a pretty developed story as well mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and you, you i like that i like when they kind of side the the job as well with the personal life and oh kind yeah of comics. because she has to she's in that sort of situation where you kind of have to go to work right away and start working you never really settle in and like it's it's like a long ass day and your son's twisting in the wind. Like the sun is like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to have this weird interaction with this native and maybe that's a terrible idea or maybe that's... Because there's no precedent. It's like, <laughs> is this, uh, is there any books written on this? Oh, there's a precedent. Uh, the standard is don't do that. Ah, uh, right. There <laughs> um, was a war, I guess. Well, and that's the thing is it comes down to there's a lot of like, you can make analogies. You can definitely draw the line between, oh, that and Native Americans. It's sometimes right. hard not to. But it's also interesting because it's not just one for one. There's not just one type of alien. There's a few different oh, types of aliens. Oh, that's great. Now, is Copperhead the name of a character or a type of thing it's in the, the town? town? Oh, okay, The town cool. of Copperhead, which oh, is yeah. such a classic mining town right, like, yeah. kind of thing. It's the perfect West name because you've got the mining Welcome kind of... Welcome to Copperhead. Because it's the old mining town and also Copperhead Snakes. Like, it's everything you get from an old West town, Yeah. except it's in space. Now, are there space snakes? I don't remember. <sighs> I, don't, I don't remember seeing a space snake because I've seen many other stranger weird things oh. that are like... Okay, let's focus on that. I guess space things aren't that weird when it's like this thing, and it's right. got like 15 heads, and it speaks British. Speaks British? You know, that language, British. 
<laughs> we all know this language, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. We're all just going to nod our heads and pretend I didn't say that. <laughs> so anyway, Copperhead, check it out. It's great. Fantastic, Mike. All right. Well, that ends our pull list. And now we're going to be rolling into our main segment. Mike, kick things off. Come on, D. The last boy on Earth. Guys, today we're taking a trip back to 1972 to hang out with a fellow named Jack Kirby. Ah, I love that guy. Now, Jack Kirby, this is actually interesting. This is not the first Jack Kirby comic we've talked about, but this is the most sort of recent, because it's from the 70s and not, you know, the 60s or 50s. Right. It's from when he flipped over to DC. He basically went across the street and started creating stuff for them and just started coming up with things like the New Gods and Darkseid and Mr. Miracle and all these yeah, amazing things. Yeah, those I things. think are popular. <laughs> those things had some staying power. Yeah, for um, sure. But Kamandi's a little bit of a strange one. Kamandi, The Last Boy on Earth, was a series that started in 72, and we're going to talk about the first issue. All right. And again, because it was a big deal they got Jack Kirby from Marvel. I mean, Jack Kirby created the Marvel Universe. He didn't create Spider-Man or Doctor Strange, but like X-Men, Daredevil, you know, Fantastic Four, Hulk, all those guys. All you him, know, you things know. that Marvel is pretty well known for at this point. Pretty much, he had a hand in all of that. So getting him over to DC was a, was a coup. Yeah. And in on the cover, it says... A sensational new DC Jack Kirby blockbuster. Wow. Because they they wanted you to know. There were ads coming in DC. They said, like, Kirby is coming. Because they made a big deal over the fact Can you that they, imagine, like, what that printing must have felt like for them? They were like, oh, we're putting that all over the front of this book. But the thing was, they didn't always know what to do with him. Because they got him, and they didn't put him on Superman. They put him on uh, Jimmy Olsen. And in Jimmy Olsen, he created the new gods and the fourth world stuff and all that stuff. That's funny that came out of Jimmy Olsen. But Jimmy Olsen back then was actually a, kind of a, a big deal comic, right? I mean, to like, a degree, less so by that point. He also created a little tiny planet with devil horns because it was a planet that was so evil that it had literal devil horns. Literally so, you know, devil horns? Jack Kirby's Jack Kirby no matter what book you put him on. <laughs> It's like, I've been wanting to do this in Marvel, and they wouldn't let me do it. And this book is very strange. Uh, and it feels, you know, it feels very much like the science fiction you would see at the time. Okay. But it's called Kamandi, The Last Boy on Earth. And we've seen Kamandi show up on uh, Batman Brave and the Bold. Yes. Um, but basically... The, he's basically like Tarzan, right? Or looks like Tarzan? He looks a little like Tarzan. He's this half-naked boy with long blonde hair mm-hmm. and a gun and a holster. Right. If uh, if Tarzan was a hitman for hire. That's right. I forgot well, that was the last point. Well, no. He's like a survival guy. Yeah. But the first issue opens... Now, every Kirby comic, or almost every Kirby comic, opens with what some people, Chris Sims from Comics Alliance, calls Kirby Scope, which is first page, splash page, open it up, and then there's a two-page splash page on pages two and three. Hmm. So the first page, splash page, is Kamandi, the last boy on Earth, paddling a raft through these ruins. There's, like, ruined buildings behind him, and in his head he's thinking... Can this be the world Granddad sent me to the surface rec- to reclaim? Is this his idea of a joyous homecoming? Two-page spread, he's in the flooded ruins of New York City. Oh, wow. Like, the Statue of Liberty is half-submerged, and there's a- the Empire State Building right next to it, pretty much. That's cool. And he's like, this is not the New York I saw in the microfilm library. This city is gone, covered by the sea. And we basically learn from the narration that there has been a natural disaster linked with radiation Kind of keeping it vague, but very tapped into what people were afraid of. Right, yeah, the Cold War stuff, absolutely. Yeah, and the people were in the bunkers, they they lived their lives, and they died dreaming of the day the radiation would be gone, and the world would be waiting, and they did not survive. They they, they died out in their bunkers, basically. Aw, um, they didn't have more kids, or, you know? They, they did not have enough. Get those bunker parties going. You have too small of a genetic gene pool, like, at some point you're just gonna run out of people. That's it's been true. that long. Wow. Or, I don't know, maybe it's been two generations. It doesn't matter, because his grandfather knows. His grandfather remembers at least the disaster. Mm. And he tells, you know, Kamandi remembers his grandfather telling him about the great shocks. And Kamandi's wondering, like, maybe that's what destroyed New York, and maybe that was oh. part of it. Like, he doesn't really know what happened. He, this is the first time he's been to the surface. And he's on his way back to the bunker, basically, where he lives. And he passes, he's along this river, and he sees these humans in rags, much like what he's wearing. He's so living, still living humans. Living humans. And he waves to them, and they get spooked and scamper away. Oh, so he's not the last man on Earth. Well, but they don't seem to respond like people would. Mm, they respond okay. like animals. Interesting. Where they see one, and they're like, ah, 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 ah. It's and, only been two generations. Well, it's been time. Right. <laughs> it's True. been however much time you need for a Jack Kirby cataclysm to happen. The details do not ever matter in a Jack Kirby comic. <laughs> it is all just like, just in your face action and drama and just pathos. Hey, sounds great. But he sees these people, they get spooked, they run away, and then he hears this explosion from the direction of his bunker. Mm. And he heads off and he rushes home. The booby traps that he'd set up have gone off, which means that these armed looters have come to 
take what's in the bunker. And the blast cleared out a few of them, but he doesn't know if there's going to be others inside. Like, if he got mm-hmm. everyone with the blast. So right. he completely ignores these bodies. There's two dead looters, just jumps past their bodies and rushes inside. And he finds two looters. You think they're all covered up. They've got, like, you know, protection from the elements, basically. Like, hoods and things. Right. And his, his grandfather's body. Because oh. they've killed his grandfather. Wow. He shoots one of them. And, you know, just laments the fact that he didn't get here in time. And the other one turns and, you know, points a rifle at him. It's a wolf, man. It's a man with a wolf what? face. <laughs> it is a it is a human wolf hybrid. This is not what Kamandi was expecting. I don't think that's what any of us were expecting. <laughs> and uh, they fight. And they, you know, it's very hard to fight a wolf man. <laughs> I imagine it is. I find a wolf with a man-like, uh, you know, movements and thoughts would actually be pretty challenging. Yeah. The, the, my one defense against wolves is, a, is opposable thumbs. Like, that's all I have going for me. <laughs> that's all you have. That's the only and your adv- wits, really. That, that, not for me. The only advantage <laughs> I, Mike Christensen, Just have? pure fear and thumbs. That's all I have. Or just these, these guys, the thumbs. And, like, if you give him those Mike two... Mike has so many thumbs. You can't see it, guys. Just so many. If the wolf also has thumbs and a gun... Like, I am out of options. I believe there's a specific type of creature that uh, this refers to, like, werewolves? Yeah, that's not what he is, though. No, he's not a werewolf? He's just a wolf man. Okay. So, Kamandi and this wolf creature fight, and Kamandi runs away through the tunnels, into these flooded tunnels, and climbs up into the rafters, and drops down a power line, and just electrocutes the wolf guy, and kills him. And then he leaves the bunker because there's nothing left for him. Yeah, his grandfather's dead. There's no more reason. It's not secure. Certainly, That's sad. the first time he left, he comes back and he the wrong time. Yeah, was the wrong time. And uh, he goes off and he finds this broken down truck. He gets it running and drives it down the ruins of the New Jersey Turnpike. And he hears these strange noises. And he looks in his rearview mirror and there's a cavalry coming, like people on horses. Mm-hmm. Oh, so wow. he pulls over to the side. And he hides the car, but he's curious, and he can't help himself. So he crawls out over a rock and looks at the horses, and it's tiger men. (laughs) I don't know what I was expecting. I was like, they're going to be people, right? No, they're tiger people. They are tiger people. They're in, you know, armor. I mean, so to a degree... They're all tiger people? It's not like some wolf, some tiger? It's all tiger people. Wow. And they're all in armor, and one of them has a centurion-style helmet on, and they call him Great Caesar. Awesome. And, and come on, he observes, this is the king of the tigers. This well, is the king of the tigers. He's a sight to behold. And Kamadi hears a noise, and he turns around, and he sees, like, above him on a rock, some sort of soldier. Someone pointing a gun at the tiger people. And he doesn't oh. know what to make of it, and he's just like, well, I can't, I can't just watch someone die. Like, if I could stop it. So he shoots the soldier, who's about to take this shot at these soldiers, and kills the guy. And the tigers run up, and they say, oh, what do we have here in the brush? And they pull him out. They say, oh, we have a hidden ally, an animal cub, no less. Well, you belong to Caesar now. And then they charge into battle against leopards. What? Leopard. So they just took Kamandi. Just put him on the back they of Caesar's horse. said, you're our pet now. Yeah. And now we're going to go fight panthers. They fight these leopards. Oh, leopards. Sorry. Who are, who are wearing musketeer hats and have Gatling what? guns. What? Wait, what? They have Gatling guns and musketeer style hats. Oh, man. This uh, this comment is moving too fast for my brain to process this quickly. <laughs> Welcome to Jack Kirby. God, jeez. <laughs> and these, these leopards are, you know, shooting, but one of them shouts, Caesar must be protected by magic spells. His <sighs> men fall, but he doesn't. And Caesar has this scepter, this, you know, this staff, basically, that he also uses as a mace. Okay. And he also uses it as a laser. <laughs> okay, all right, hold on. <laughs> no. No, 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 hold on. <laughs> you can't use a mace as a laser, Mike. That does not make sense. Sure, you hit people with it, and then you fire lasers out of it. All right. Absolutely you can. It's just a scepter that's also you hit people and then shoot oh, lasers. Oh, come on, D. Your crazy world. It's and, too crazy for me. And Caesar's like, all right, I can't lead these guys into battle and also take care of this pet. So he hands off Kamandi to one of his attendants, who just bops him on the head, knocks him out, and Kamandi wakes up in the back of a wagon, in a, in wow. a cage. Hey, that guy gets things done. We rejoin Kamandi in the Royal City Kennels, where there's a bunch of tigers whipping humans. Oh. These are these are humans who, again, this is just like what we saw earlier, they're basically straight out of Planet of the Apes, because they're all wearing rags and they do not speak English. They don't speak interesting they don't articulate they are animals and there's a a dog boy or a dog man basically this this servant comes in with this bowl of gruel and just and all these humans clamor over each other just to get to the food and these guards and of course Kamandi's like man now there's dog people like why not <laughs> what else what else did the radiation make bird men penguin people the guards are impressed with Kamandi's fight he's scrappy uh, because he hasn't been broken by society and nature. Right, he things. can actually speak, too. He, does, he doesn't, exactly. But though very few people seem to really 
get that that's a big deal. They're like, oh, look at this curiosity. And also he's saying very little things. Things you could probably pick up. Like, right. unhand me, or I'll fight you. Like, it's not that impressive to them. You no, know, he's not like, E equals MC squared, guys. Exactly. I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> right. And they, they, they're they impressed with him, though, and they wish they could train him in the arena. They wish they could take him to fight. But he's Caesar's pet, so, you know, spruce him up and put him in some royal duds. And he makes a break for it, and they just take him down with a fire hose. And they're like, well, they needed a bath anyway. Ha 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 ha. Ah, and, the humor of tiger people. And then they, the next time we see him, he's wearing this royal finery and taken out. I don't know why I imagined him in head to toe and just tons of feathers. I have no <laughs> idea why. That's my that's my version of finery, Do I guess. Do you know what a Jack Kirby comic looks like? I, I, I guess not. <laughs> you can probably guess what he's wearing if you've read a Jack Kirby comic. It's okay. tiny little bicycle shorts and this weird... <laughs> bulky armor that's got circles on it i think actually i do have a pretty good idea of what that looks like <laughs> that's amazing and they take him into this the courtyard this arena but you know this this basically area where caesar is leading this ceremony and this basically victory speech slash prayer and he mm. says in the name of the mighty warhead which guides our destiny great caesar once again returns victorious in battle against our enemies and this nuclear missile lifts out of a silo what? tube and they all start saying all hail to the warhead. Keep us strong, O oh warhead. Well, to say that they're playing with fire is certainly an understatement, as they're playing with a nuclear warhead.